There are moments in the lives of all of us when we must make decisions. And it is very important that we develop a certain skill in deciding the proper courses of action. This is only one example of the importance of the integration of the inner personality. Without some solid foundation of conviction, it is very difficult for us to chart any program or determine value in any area uh, which comes to our attention. It is therefore important to our discussion this morning that we tell something of the background behind the power of man to decide, how this power operates in daily life and the resources which make decision possible. Beginning, of course, with the foundation of our existence, we can act as conscious beings because we possess some attribute of consciousness. Consciousness is perhaps best described simply as a kind of luminance. It is an intellectual, moral, or spiritual light. It is through consciousness that we are able to bestow order upon life around us and integration upon the elements of our own characters. Consciousness is awareness. It is awareness of value. It is the link between the individual and the world around him. It is also the faculty by which he tries to estimate the world within him. Now it is inevitable to man, apparently, that consciousness will be an imperfect function. We have not yet reached a degree of insight or growth whereby consciousness can be infallible in its function. We are, however, aware that we have natural instincts and that these instincts are frequently more sound and more valid than the interpretations which we impose upon them by our own minds. The principal difficulty, therefore, in the function of consciousness is mental interference. Mental interference, of course, seems to be inevitable. We are not able to be aware of consciousness except as a mental phenomena. But actually, consciousness appears to be a profound and abiding intuitive or instinctive faculty or power or energy by which it is possible to arrive very often at a more reasonable conclusion than is possible by the procedure of mentation itself or thinking. Thus it very often arises in our common experience that when we are faced by some difficulty, we immediately react with a flash of conscious apperception. We are aware intuitively of value, and this value causes a decision to arise within us, a decision or an interpretation or an understanding which is perhaps nearer to the truth than any other process uh, with which we can come uh, to a mental decision. The moment, however, this instinct to decide according to light comes to us, mind moves in and begins in one way or another to modify this decision. The first thing that perhaps we wonder when we have decided inwardly the proper course of an action is how advantageous or disadvantageous this decision will be in practical application. 
we may say to ourselves, we know what is right, uh, but this which is right is not expedient. In other words, to achieve a condition of consistency with the intuitive value that we realize, we must in some way make a sacrifice, a sacrifice of some advantage, of some opinion, or of some policy. We begin to weigh the advantages of integrity against the advantages of compromise, and usually end in compromise. We are not able uh, to take the full responsibility as human beings for the best use of our own inward enlightenment. Knowing certain things to be true, we still act contrary to that knowledge. And the only explanation of this contrariness must lie in mental interference. Mental interference in this case may also be supported by emotional interference. And the person who perhaps would choose to be of good character in an undertaking ends up uh, in a very faulty position. He lacks the courage to make the proper decision. Now in what way does courage get into this problem? Courage probably represents to a large degree the energizing of an attitude. Courage is that power which gives us the continuity of effort necessary to support a conviction. It also gives us a certain sense of value by means of which we try to remain true to principle. Thus, the effort to support a right decision is usually called courage. By courage, we also mean that the individual weighing and measuring a decision is determined or resolved to take the responsibilities which must accompany decision. The individual who is not willing to face the results of his own decision will immediately begin to compromise that decision in his own thinking. This also gives us this other thought now of responsibility. Whenever we make up our minds to do something, we must accept or assume the consequences of our decision. Very often we are not sure what these consequences will be. We are not certain in our own minds that we have a sufficient grasp of the whole problem. But in any event, any decision which is contrary to the most idle and inane attitude must call for decision and the exception of responsibility. Responsibility also carries with it to our present thinking uh, the thought of burden. Responsibility to most people means that they must accept and carry burdens which they do not really wish to accept or carry. Responsibility becomes an impairment of freedom. It becomes a limitation of the individual's rights to do what he pleases by imposing upon him some strict code from within himself which dominates pleasure with duty. Thus we come to another uh, situation, namely that decision may involve duty. Uh, duty means the acceptance of certain responsibilities which we sense to be ours and the patient bearing of this uh, burden over a period of years in many cases. And duty is to the modern person an unpleasant thought. It will interfere with his personal pleasures. And against the importance of these pleasures, the mind again weighs the acceptance of responsibility. Therefore, in 
fact, the mind becomes an evader, giving us innumerable excuses for doing what we please and trying to fashion a strong reason why we should not do what is necessary. Decisions bear largely upon necessity. Uh, certain responsibilities, certain obligations are necessary. So as an out against our mental weaknesses comes this problem of immediate necessity where it is obvious that a thing must be done or the penalty for failing to do it is too heavy for us to bear, then we regard certain decisions as necessary. They must be made whether we wish to make them or not. We must weigh in this case the ultimates in terms of their uh, importance to ourselves. It becomes evident that the individual, whether he wishes to or not, must work if he wishes to live. If he cannot decide to accept employment, he must face destitution. In such a case, the decision is a necessary one. And it is, uh, in our way of life, only the necessary decision that receives uh, more or less complete moral support. We do try to do those things that are absolutely necessary. We sense that we cannot afford not to do them. Yet there are many border decisions of things almost necessary, the things which in their uh, probable results call for a strong decision. But if they can be avoided, or evaded in any way, we have a tendency to be reluctant to accept responsibility. Our best excuse for indecision, and in some instances a partly valid one, is ignorance. We do not know what our decision will lead to. We realize that persons making hasty decision often repent and find that by a wave of enthusiasm or a tremendous burst of courage, they have taken on a situation which will be an embarrassment and liability to them from that time on. Consequently, we cannot say that the hasty decision is always the best. Yet mostly, we find that the hasty decision is the only one we can make. For well, the moment we hesitate or delay, this intervention of mental evasion begins. And if we do not decide immediately, we will probably not decide at all. Philosophy is of the greatest help to us in these problems because it gives us some kind of general framework, a perspective on values, which should enable us to make decisions more effectively. Experience also provides a powerful incentive to decision, for it reveals again and again uh, the weakness of indecision and how indecision can gradually complicate the whole pattern of existence. Spiritual conviction, our religious lives, also contribute uh, to decision. They help us to avoid certain negative uh, attitudes. They impel us to try to make a constructive decision in a moment of emergency. Uh, if our religious life is strong and sincere, we may base our decisions partly upon the admonition of our religion. In many instances, such admonition is helpful, depending largely upon the degree of enlightenment of the faith involved. But religion does give us the courage to accept responsibility or duty. Therefore, it is a voice in the direction of man living under self-bestowed or self-accepted responsibilities. To gain some skill 
in the making of decision, therefore, we have to call upon whatever resources we possess within ourselves. We have to try to uh, be reasonably aware and profoundly thoughtful. And the more we can be reasonable and thoughtful, the more likely our decisions are to be advantageous and constructive. So with this background of the problem, we must try to understand a little better uh, how to go about the actual process of deciding things. Decision next presents us with a problem of choice. Nearly always a decision involves two or more possible answers. Decision, therefore, uh, is a matter of determining between good and bad, or even better and best. Some things seemingly are so divided in their values that decision is extremely difficult. In these matters, wherein there seems to be no clear indication to ourselves as to which is the wiser course. Under this situation, it is often wisest to suspend decision, uh, to wait until the situation clarifies to some degree, to wait until a more obvious indication of directive is available. So in this case, perhaps, we can use the word perhaps advantageously, that we can not say we will not decide, but we will not pass judgment upon the evidence available. Uh, this can happen in law, where a judge is not satisfied uh, with the available information. He is not certain that it is possible for himself or a jury to come to a reasonable conclusion on the basis of the facts at hand at that moment. This may call for a retrial, or this may call for recalling witnesses, or whatever process is necessary in order to increase available knowledge on the subject. The uh, simple yes-no decisions are for the most part relating to problems in which some strong moral factor is involved. Wherever the individual may, must make a decision within the area of his judgment, uh, the area of his attained insight, it is usually important for this decision to be clear-cut. It is often necessary, however, to hold in abeyance the realization that all decision is, is based upon available knowledge, and that if the pattern of this available knowledge should change at some future date, then the decision must be reconsidered. To cling desperately to a decision after it is outworn or no longer practical does not indicate loyalty or dedication. It is simply a form of stubbornness arising sometimes from arrogance, the individual unwilling to admit that he was previously wrong, chooses to perpetuate the error rather than to revise his own thinking. Actually, the human mind is provided very largely for the purpose of decision-making. It bestows upon man the, the possibility of placing upon his life a pattern, self-imposed, by means of which he can be impelled towards the unfolding of certain values. If he does not accept uh, this decision and becomes a drifter, he will gradually lose the power of decision. It is like every other power in man. It must be exercised or it gradually ceases uh, to uh, be a force in his life. Thus, indecision is habit-forming, just as decision can create a habit pattern. In the past, experience has shown to us that decisions are most easily made by persons of comparatively simple thinking. The mind which is not too confused or not too complicated by outside circumstances can very often come to a reasonable decision more quickly 
than the highly trained intellectual mind uh, can hope uh, to accomplish this end. Thus, in most instances, simple direct thinking uh, leads to decision. Complicated thinking nearly always leads to indecision. This is one of the problems that always confronts an unfolding intellectual culture. Uh, the more uh, enlightened we become in certain ways, the more difficult it becomes to say yes or no. In our search for more light, we come upon such a diversity of factors that it becomes evident finally that the yes and no attitude is a very difficult one. It becomes so obvious to us that there are many answers that intellectualism enlarges the area of mental possibilities until we are confused by the very superabundance of possible courses of action. If we are competitively simple people, we can decide among the small area of things known. But if we have a greater knowledge, we are inclined to weaken the decisive factor until perhaps at the end of a very profound career, we begin to wonder whether we can decide anything or not. This uh, do, is due in part to our concept of realities. Uh, what is true? If we are comparatively limited in our horizon, we have many certainties which have not yet been jogged out of their relationships by increased knowledge. Thus it is easier for us to choose among them something and cling desperately to it. But as the area of possibilities increases and we begin to search for motives, uh, try to plumb the depths of other persons' characters in an effort to find the reasons for their actions, we may come at the end to a condition in which we can decide little, if anything. This, however, should only apply to our relations with other people. Actually, decisions to most of us do involve other persons. Our decisions must be as to whether we wish a certain person for a friend, whether we wish to do business with a certain firm or organization, uh, how we shall decide the education of our children. Who shall be responsible for domestic incompatibility? All these different questions uh, arising in the very uh, simple primitive mind can be answered quickly. But as we have expanded our insight and consciousness, answers are more difficult to attain. Always, therefore, the more intellectual we become, the more important it is that consciousness lead intellect. If it does not, we fall into uh, a mental confusion. No, no degree of intellectualism can compensate for a clear internal intuitive sense of value. This must remain clear or we will not make adequate decisions. Suppose we then uh, take it for granted that we have these decisions to make and we divide them into two categories. Decisions which primarily involve ourselves, uh, decisions which primarily involve others. Wherever the decision is one in which uh, our own uh, destiny is principally concerned, we have a greater right for decision. A decision in which uh, we must decide to involve other persons in the decision. This requires greater thoughtfulness and greater sense of justice. We must try, however, whether in our own decision about ourselves or about others, to be ever mindful of this factor of justice. What is the just thing to do? What is that which is essentially right? The moment we try to solve this problem, we realize that the standard of right for each of us is invested largely in our own concepts. While there are certain basic laws of society which we cannot break with impunity, there are innumerable 
problems involving abstract justice in which the decisions depend entirely upon our own degree of insight. Justice changes with times. Uh, justice is complicated by circumstances. And justice must always imply that it is best for all concerned. This, of course, presents a very difficult matter when most persons are concerned primarily with what is best for them and are not too much inclined to extend the concept of justice uh, if it interferes with personal advantage. Decisions also cause the individual a great deal of personal emotional hurt in a great many cases. Even if the justice of the matter is rather clearly indicated, uh, we know that other people may not appreciate this justice, may not value it, and may find it detrimental uh, to their own advantage at the moment. If, therefore, we attempt to be just, we may definitely interfere with the injustice which other individuals prefer uh, to uh, practice. Therefore, we have to ask our, ourselves the question, to what degree have we a right to hurt other people? Actually, we have no right to hurt other people at all. But very often, what we call hurting them is interfering with their right to hurt someone else or themselves. Have we a right, therefore, uh, to refrain from cooperating with a person who is wrong, even though that person may be near to us, may be a member of our family, and as far as that's concerned, could be ourselves. Have we a right to withhold cooperation when by so doing we shall displease another or cause this other person to consider us in an unfavorable light? Here, of course, is the major basis in all decisions involving justice. And uh, it is a hard decision. And it is a decision in which we must assume the responsibility of the justice of our own point of view. Our problem is therefore primarily, are we right in the decision that we make? Not whether we will please the other person, but are we just? Is our own point of view a factual one? Or are we also being over-influenced by some ulterior motive or some situation in which we seek not justice but advantage for ourselves? Here we have probably basic recourse principally to law or to the advice and opinion of those skilled in such matters where a very important decision involving other persons must be made, it is sometimes necessary for the average individual to have professional help or guidance, to try and make sure, if he is sincere, that his judgment or decision is the best for all concerned. One of the most common and simple expressions of this problem is decisions relating to small children. Here the parent has to take the responsibility. Here the parent's own attitude or conviction must lead the child and must also indicate the path of justice or reality or truth in the matter. Uh, the child may not be able to defend its own rights, however, and this again is a very important question. Decisions made by parents must be just. If they are not just, they will injure. If they are just, they will not injure. To make a just uh, decision, therefore, the parent must have justice in his own consciousness. He must sincerely, earnestly desire that his decision will be right. Not easy, but right. Uh, not a compromise to please everybody, 
but the kind of a decision which will ultimately achieve the greater good for all concerned. It may be necessary for the parent to displease the child at the moment, or it may be necessary for the parent to make a major change in his own attitudes in order to meet the reasonable needs and justice for that child. So the parent has to think it through. Now the olden parent tried to think it through. He thought it through prayerfully. God was his first line of defense against selfishness. He really believed that he, if he took this problem into the religious level of his consciousness, that he would be guided or led. Because by religion, he would be lifted into the best quality of his own nature. It would not be so likely that in the presence of his prayerful beseeching of divine aid that he would permit himself to be completely dominated by his own selfishness. It was against his religion to be totally self-centered. Therefore, if he took this problem into his religious life, he also had the advantage of scriptural admonitions on these matters, and he felt that he could fall back upon the great code of his faith for the directive and the guidance in this particular emergency. If he was sincere, he would follow this code even though it revealed effects in his own nature which required correction. Today, however, uh, this whole situation has considerably changed. Against decision today, is a kind of weakness in ourselves, the desperate desire not to offend anybody, the desperate desire not to face an unpleasant scene caused by any attitude of our own. We do not wish to become involved in the difficult procedure of keeping other people honest. It is much easier for us to let them go their way and try to maintain a certain uh, comfortable sense of relaxation in ourselves. This is particularly true of our relationship with children and adolescents. Uh, here we find that to deny the child what it wants today is very likely to cause a most unpleasant domestic situation. The child who has already learned that with a good flare of tyranny it can get what it wants, creates a scene, discomforts the whole family, embarrasses the individual in the relation to his neighbors and associates, and very often the child has a strong defensive point that all his friends are permitted to do these things and therefore he loses status among his own associates if these privileges are denied him. So little by little, he wears down the resistance of his elders. Yet perhaps the very thing he is attempting to defend is not essentially right or essentially good, and he will ultimately regret uh, being given permission to do these things which he is struggling so desperately uh, to gain at the present time. The parent has to face this, and the modern parent does not want to face it. If it gets too bad, the parent will take the child to a child analyst or something of that nature and try to solve the problem that way. But in the American home, yes and no decisions uh, on matters relating to the privileges of the young are becoming scarcer every day. There seems to be no way of controlling the conduct of these young people. And of course, usually, the decision process begins too late. The parent waits until the child is in rather serious difficulty or on the verge of a real problem before the parent attempts to enforce any pattern of discipline, then nothing can be accomplished. Having failed to create understanding in the child as it grows up, 
having failed to emphasize to the child either by instruction or example or both the importance of self-directive and self-control. The child is at a serious disadvantage and is not at all interested in a justice which he knows nothing about. So here the matter of decision becomes uh, a, troubled, a troubled one. It can lead to unpleasantness and it can lead sometimes almost to tragedy. So the parent has to weigh this kind of matter very carefully to try to determine where truth is. What is the truth of the situation? If the parental requirement is right, not motivated by selfishness, not dominated by an attempt to escape the responsibilities of parenthood, if this decision is an honest and just one, good for both parent and child, then it must be made and it must be enforced, even at the expense of a troubled scene. The reason why it must be made and enforced is that failure to do so merely procrastinates a serious condition. It pushes into the future something which must ultimately be faced, and the longer it is delayed, the greater the problem will be. The parent who cannot uh, lead in decision for the children or the child must ultimately bestow upon society an undisciplined human being, th that child, whose power to damage the world in which it lives increases with every year of its own life, and the power to damage its own happiness and its own future uh, increases to the degree that it cannot be properly controlled and directed during formative years. There can be no doubt of this, and yet the parent is inclined to put off the evil day simply because the whole matter is unpleasant. Uh, in uh, matters of decision, therefore, we have to fight through this unpleasantness in our effort to determine the facts. Another area in which decisions have to be made that are sometimes extremely difficult are in cases uh, of incompatibility in home life. Uh, this type of decision, if it is delayed too long, uh, leads to the most desperate uh, dilemmas, disasters, and tragedies. If it becomes obvious that human beings cannot abide together in peace and order, then decisions have to be made. The longer these decisions are procrastinated, the greater the personal damage to all involved. The greater the degree of antagonism and animosity that is allowed to develop around a core of incompatibility. Uh, the more difficult it is for these individuals to hold reasonable and decent attitudes toward each other. Not to be able to view other persons with a certain amount of basic respect, even if there may be an absence of affection. When we lose respect, we damage our own psyche. Uh, the, today there are millions of persons who are becoming mentally and emotionally sick because they have not had the courage to break up an impossible situation. They have maintained it for a variety of ulterior motives, when the only motive which is respectable and proper has been lost sight of. They have no uh, way of determining the mutual damage that is going to result if they are unable to clear up a situation that is bad. Therefore, decisions are important in clearing air. Decisions must be made where it is obvious that a continuous indecision is simply going to compound a misery. If such a time arises, this misery cannot be compounded indefinitely without increasing damage to all concerned. And it was tragic indeed to assume that through indecision and incompatibility in a home, one or both members may ultimately end in a mental institution. This is not necessary. It is not proper. 
the human relationships have to be right or wrong. If they are right, they have to be protected and preserved. If they are wrong, they have to be corrected. And if correction is impossible, then the situa situation must come to a final, conclusive decision. All the way along, we find that decisions are the most painless ways of solving things. They are often uncomfortable and unpleasant at the moment they are made. But in the long run, they result in clarification. They result in the removal of impossible factors or situations whereby the individual may have a right to a proper kind of life. Now, it does not mean that in decisions of this kind it is necessary to decide which person is right or which person is wrong. And this, of course, is where most uh, decisions go on the rocks. The decision is always dominated by a degree of self-defense. We have to be right. We have to be in a situation in which the other person is principally at fault. It is rare indeed to find a situation in which both persons are willing to accept an equal share of common responsibility. Occasionally we find this situation. But usually, where this exists, the condition can be corrected without any great amount of tragedy. Mostly, however, the individual must feel aggrieved. He must be the one who has been placed in the impossible situation, and he must therefore retaliate in some way. Any decision in which retaliation is involved is defeated immediately because the main end of decision is honor. And where ulterior motive, vengeance, or anything of this nature creeps in, honor is lost. So decisions are not as to who is right. The decision is, is the situation right? And upon this decision, we have to finally move. We cannot successfully judge other people. But we can judge relationships as to whether they are advisable or not advisable. We can judge whether or not we wish to follow the courses of these other people, whether we want to accept their attitudes or their codes or their standards or their policies. We have no right to judge them as human beings, but we have the right to decide our own relation with them. And if this relation is not satisfactory or is in some way an insult to our intelligence or an offense to our ethics, then we have a right to withdraw by the simple decision of doing so. Usually, however, such a decision involves some kind of a selfish situation. We would like to withdraw from this situation, but to break this particular association would mean to lose an influential friend, uh, to in some way uh, damage our social state, uh, to involve ourselves in some kind of a situation which we would regard as embarrassing. Therefore, rather than be right, we continue to avoid embarrassment. And the longer we do this, the more hopelessly we become involved in an impossible condition. Uh, all this type of situation contributes to the tremendous mental and emotional pressure which we feel such a burden upon us today. We're exhausted, worn out, tired, disillusioned, disappointed in life. And many of these situations have arisen from inability to make proper decision. We have gradually uh, learn to accept so many things that we do not like or do not believe to be right, uh, that we suffer along through the years under loads which we should have clarified and lifted by decision long ago. Uh, we cannot, uh, in our modern way of life, permit these expediences to become the dominant considerations unless we wish to be more tired more exhausted, more uh, disturbed continuously 
by the pressures of circumstances. If we must continue to exist in an offensive pattern, one that we do not believe in, uh, we are bound to suffer as human beings. Consequently, we have a right to say this beyond any reasonable doubt, that where a decision involves ourselves alone, we have every right to live as near to truth as it is possible for us to do, and we cannot afford not to make every decision as nearly truthful as it is possible for us to make it. If this means that we have to change our ways of life, such changes may be very useful to us. If it means correcting faults, then we must correct them. If it means uh, increasing our knowledge or skill, then we must increase that knowledge or skill. Or if it implies greater control and directive over our own mental and emotional processes, we must achieve this control or directive. So having decided what is best for us next in the immediate future of things, we have to abide by this decision and we have to resolve to apply the necessary energy to support this decision uh, along the way. Uh, not long ago, a young man came in to see me who was struggling with the problem of his education. Uh, he did not wish to do certain things, but he knew that other things needed to be done. We talked it over and we decided that the general pattern of education that he was following was not perhaps the best for him, that it would be better for him to take a year or two of specific training within a certain field where he had aptitudes. <coughs> if this young man says to himself, well, when I get around to it, perhaps I'll do this, he will never do it. If he looks at the matter and says, here are two years in which I must continue to study when I would be much happier out making enough money to buy a new car, he will never make this decision. If, however, he looks forward into his own future and decides that this additional training is necessary for his final security in life, then he has every reason to make this decision. And having made it, he must have the energy to energize his own decision. Having once decided that he needed this extra two years of specialized training, he should give the matter no further thought whatever except to roll up his sleeves and do it. If he allows himself to begin to weigh the advantages and the disadvantages, he will almost certainly gradually weaken his decision. The best thing for him to do is to go uh, enroll in this particular school which he felt was appropriate to his needs, pay his hard money for his enrollment fee, and go. Any weakening of this attitude would be desperately detrimental to him. Another man comes in who is further along in the pattern of life. He has had a number of jobs. He has succeeded in talking himself out of all of them. He always says the wrong thing at the wrong time, and he never permits the foreman to run the job. He has to run it for him. Well, the foreman is one of those, always one of those cruel and unpleasant people who think they know what they want better than the men do. So he is locked in trouble all the time. He is able, he is well uh, fitted for his work, but he simply cannot do what he is told to do and which he is trained to do. He must enter into a feud with his superiors on some basis or other. The feud in his case can be either his belief that he knows more than they do which is a tragic mistake, or else that he can differ with them in politics, religion, uh, social problems, or almost any matter. And he always succeeds in being laid off at the end of a few months. This man has a decision to make, but he is very cagey about making it. He knows essentially his trouble. He said when he came to see me, he said, my big trouble is I can't keep my big mouth shut. 
Now, there is no one who cannot keep his big mouth shut if he wants to. The fact is, he must decide to keep it shut, and having made the decision, must energize that decision with enough volitional power to lock his jaws if necessary. He cannot make the decision and then keep on going like a running brook. So here is a decision. He knows what is wrong. He also, however, lacks the uh, energy uh, to do what is right. So he will continue to drift and he will continue to dr go along trying to accomplish that which cannot be accomplished. Uh, a situation of adjustment with a society which his own temperament will not permit him to adjust with. Now, his only other out, if he wants to really get down to serious thinking, is for him to train himself and skill himself until he can be the foreman. But this is a little too difficult. He really thinks he is already, but other people haven't noticed it. <laughs> so uh, he has not the energy to do the larger accomplishment in himself. And he, do he knows uh, the values and facts involved. He is making trouble for himself and other people. They naturally resent it. If he has the wisdom and the decision to know what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish, and will settle down quietly to a plan energized by his own will and sustained by his own consciousness, he can gradually achieve the condition he wants. But this means continuity of effort and the continuous energizing of a, of a plan, of a pattern, of a way of doing things which he himself knows to be right and necessary. It is the lack of this power to make the decision and keep it that has permitted a negative habit of his own to take complete control of his life. It will only be a little while before a person like this drifts into the condition of being unemployable. He then has nothing to look forward to except social security. He has no way of coping with the world situation as it is. Now, it is not necessary for this man to believe that his foreman is all-wise or all-knowing or a noble character. But he is being paid to do a job. He is being paid to fulfill the requirements of a day's work. His own character must permit him to earn his own wage. And if he is unable to accept the idea of earning it under a certain situation, then he must change his own relation with society through constructive achievement of his own. He cannot enter into a one-man war against foreman. This will not work. It will only end in disaster for himself. So there are all kinds of these personal decisions. A mother man comes and says, I'm getting along very well. I, I see a good future. I have a close and uh, sympathetic family. But I discover, somewhat to my embarrassment, that I'm drinking too much. I'm gradually developing into an alcoholic. This man says he, he is convinced that he is not yet an alcoholic, but he sees the symptoms coming. He is working with other men who have also drifted into alcoholism. And this poor chap is in a complete dilemma. He has not the slightest idea what to do about it. It has frankly not occurred to him to stop drinking. <laughs> This is just too much. <laughs> it hasn't occurred to him that he has the strength of character to stop. It hasn't really occurred to him that there's much of anything he can do. He's almost ready to go out somewhere and spend five or ten thousand dollars taking some kind of a cure. He feels that the only way that he can stop drinking is to have somebody else stop for him. <laughs> If he can only have some elaborate process to build up his self-confidence, or if he can have a pill or an injection 
or something of this nature which will solve the problem, then perhaps he can get over it. This man is in the face of a decision. Why can't he make the decision? Well, probably because he has never made one in his life before and has no knack for it. He has not been a person of decision. He happened to have a fair education, a fair start in life. He dropped into a fairly good situation and has stayed in it. He is able, but he has no basic strength. He has never been tested in any great decision of life. He happens to have a rather good family that is pulling for him. It's not a strong family, but it's on his side. He has had nothing that really forced him uh, to make a, a clear-cut decision. To uh, face a situation of this nature with the alarm and anxiety which is uh, hurting this man is almost unbelievable. Yet it is common to millions of persons today. They simply do not know how to say yes or no and mean it. They do not know how to say this I will not do and stop doing it. They can say the words time after time. Perhaps many of them have said them a hundred times. But there's no energy behind this. The individual lasts on his decision for two or three days or maybe a month and then he's back, right back where he was before. There is no continuous support. This man, in other words, has no confidence in himself. He has no sense of the, of the strength of his own basic character. He is perhaps not religious enough to have any great faith and divine intercession in these matters. He is not enough of a philosopher to recognize the power of consciousness within himself. And he's not enough of a psychologist to know that he can change his own mind. All these negatives working against him simply prevent him from making a decision which he knows he should make and which his natural responsibilities require that he must make. Here is a simple problem of trying to get a little libido into a decision. He just doesn't seem to know how to go about it. Uh, one way that many people have found to help out this when they are a little weak and do not know what to do next is that the one thing this man could do would be to go to everybody he knows and tell them all that he stopped drinking. This will sometimes produce the necessary result because he is then thrown into the situation of being forced to admit his weakness to many other people if he drinks from that point on. He doesn't want to face his fellow club members after he has told them this. He doesn't want to go home and face his family after he has told them this. He certainly doesn't want to face his employer or his fellow workmen after he has assured them that he is not going to do this anymore. So if he makes a wide enough public announcement, perhaps it will have helped. Strange and funny as this may be, I know a case in a small town where a man with a decision of this kind paid for an announcement in the newspaper so that the whole town would know. <laughs> and it helped. He did finally succeed in overcoming the fault uh, which he had publicly announced that he was now about to cure. <laughs> so very often this type of thing will help a little because it throws the individual's ego into the pattern his self-pride, his uh, uh, sense of uh, being admired by those around him will then force him to keep the decision he has made. Now, the, uh, we can assume that most thoughtful persons are capable of decisions about themselves, decisions which they can gradually learn to make. And much of this type of decisional work comes almost uh, automatically if we begin to raise the level of our own understanding. The more we appreciate the values of life, the better a philosophy of life we have, uh, the deeper our convictions about realities become, 
the more likely we are to live in harmony with these convictions. This doesn't inevitably follow, but it certainly is a contributing helpful factor, one that very often does take over and will assist us to overcome some of the more common faults to which we are subjected. But we do come into this larger area of decisions involving other people primarily, and these decisions may or may not arise distinctly and definitely from within our own characteristics, but may belong in our area of relationships. Actually, of course, relationships are an extension of characteristics, so we cannot divide one from the other completely. But most persons are especially afraid to make decisions which will affect other people. We don't want to hurt other people. We do not want to lose their regard and respect. Uh, we do not want to primarily be the cause of any further sorrow for them. And if we are sincere in this, it does make us thoughtful. Although too often our sincerity is the fact that we do not want uh, to be forced into a, an experience that is unpleasant because of our decision involving another. It is unpleasantness that we are desperately attempting to avoid rather than the value involved in the situation. If we have grown up through the years without any emphasis upon decisions, if in childhood we have never made any, if we have grown up in life drifting along lines of least resistance, then all decisions become very painful. Every child should have a heritage of decisions. It should be brought up in an environment where decisions are made, and it should be invited to make its own decisions of a constructive and proper nature. Otherwise, it reaches maturity without any skill in this matter or any recognition of its importance or its practical value. When we begin to, to work with other persons, one uh, point is nearly always obvious, namely that when we get around to deciding to make a decision, we are almost invariably late. We are so late that the situation is already well out of hand. We begin to realize that this decision would have been quite possible and much easier 20 years ago than it is now. We have gradually allowed situations to create patterns. We have supported these patterns for a long time, and it is rather bewildering to all concerned if we suddenly withdraw that support. We have been doing something until everyone has become accustomed to our doing it that way. They have come to expect it, require it, demand it, and they are going to be very unhappy if we change. So this kind of a decision nearly always is one that has been built up until we have finally painted ourselves into corners where it is almost impossible to get out. <clears throat> Sometime, however, in the course of this pattern, the decision may be forced upon us. One common type of decision involving this situation is the person who is easily imposed upon. There are some people uh, who simply are perpetual victims of some form of unfair treatment. They are negative a little bit. They think they are very kind. Usually they are quite weak. But they are constantly and continuously victimized. These kind of people have built up a surrounding pattern in which others have come to expect to victimize these weaker ones. Uh, they have come to take the same attitude toward these persons that neighboring nations seem to be developing toward the United States. They expect us to feed them forever. They do not expect us to expect them to be grateful. They do not expect us to expect them to pay back anything. We are presumed to be uh, a kind of kindly, stupid people who uh, will support anybody for any reason, for any length of time. 
Now, there are people like this. And if suddenly one of these persons who has been acting as a lady bountiful to some cause withdraws this support, everyone is highly indignant. It becomes a, ma a major decision leading to all kinds of unhappiness, and disturbance, uh, misunderstanding, and actual hatred in too many instances. Yet along the way, every thoughtful person has to sit down a little bit and judge what his character pattern is doing to other people. Is he helping or is he hurting? And in the final analysis, if he wakes up, he must decide to do that which is helpful. He has to decide many things, perhaps, that he is not particularly anxious to decide. He has to think through what will happen if his children inherit his wealth. Uh, he has ga gained or saved all through the years in order to provide these children with an inheritance. What is he giving them? Is he giving them the foundation of a better life, or is he giving them an opportunity for personal ruin? These things a thoughtful person must think through. If he does not think things like this, through. He is inevitably, perhaps without any intention, going to hurt people. He is going to do more harm than good. He is going to make life impossible for those around him. So he has to decide how his actions are going to affect others. And he also then is going to have to decide why he acts as he does now. Is this person who is struggling desperately to leave a vast inheritance, is he doing this because of primary love for his children? Is this the thing that motivates him? Is he really concerned over their security? Is their good his real purpose? Or is this whole thing merely an excuse that he has developed within himself, an excuse for a power drive? which he cannot justify unless he believes that the end justifies the means. If he did not have a noble purpose, presumably, at the end of it all, he probably could not endure his own procedures from day to day. So because he believes that he is going to leave it all to his children or all to charity, he allows a power drive to dominate his own conduct. He thinks he is being a great magnanimous philanthropist. Actually, he is a person who really enjoys the process of hoarding money. And he has to find an excuse uh, which will justify him in his own eyes and in the sight of other people. He has to sit down also, however, and think it through. What is he doing to himself? What is he doing to others? Normally, we find uh, that the greatest damage that can possibly done, be done is for individuals in any position of authority over a circumstance to allow it to drift into a negative, useless, helpless pattern. This is very common in families, where nearly always a family is supporting one member at least who is a drifter, who is not doing anything except sponging on the family. Family dedications, family ties, uh, family sense of responsibility will cause people to maintain these drifters, will cause them to continue uh, to encourage the weak to be weaker, and may go so far as to encourage the strong to be weak, because many persons who have started out and were perfectly willing to find their own way, have been weakened by some form of overindulgence as they went along. So we have to find out somewhere, some way, where the facts are. And one of the simplest facts that we observe everywhere in nature is that the more you overprotect life, the more you weaken it. If you put plants in a hothouse, they can no longer live out of doors. 
if you, uh, in one way or another, domesticate creatures, you take from them their self-reliance. And in the case of man, the more you do for him, the less he will ever do for himself. Everything which happens to an individual which protects him from the need to experience the fact of life, such things are detrimental to him. Anything which will cause him to believe that he can expect to be rewarded out of reasonable relationship to the value of his own effort. Anything which has to do with the get-rich-quick policy or waiting for the old folks to die is bad for all concerned. It weakens, it destroys, it disintegrates. And any individual who is in a position to make decisions in such cases should be motivated largely by the realization that the decision which causes the person to stand on his own feet is the best decision always. If situations have reached such an impossible impasse that such uh, natural values can no longer uh, be uh, clearly stated, then the decision which produces as much as possible in this direction is the more valuable. If we can convince individuals to try to pre themselves uh, for individual existence, if we can teach them trades even late in life, if we can give them self-pride and independence, even though perhaps they are past the best productive years, anything which helps the individual to be proud of his own conduct, helps him to have an individual and personal life and helps him to meet his own needs according to his own efforts. Any decisions in this way are the best for the person. They help that individual to regain what nature wanted him to have in the first place, and that is individual initiative. And so often decisions have a tendency uh, to drown this initiative in some form of benevolence and such benevolence is always essentially wrong. Now, in most cases in life, decisions are not as open and shut as we might wish them to be. Uh, decisions very often contain elements which involve both agreement and disagreement. Sometimes we can shuffle out these elements and make separate decisions involving each factor. Sometimes this is not uh, quite so uh, easy or as simple as we might believe. Let us take the problem of a decision involving a young, inexperienced person. Now, how are we going to handle a case of this nature? A young girl, about 16 years old, has reached that period in life in which she is very anxious to be on her own. Uh, her family is a little doubtful as to whether this is the best and wisest course, so they are not encouraging it too strongly. The girl is becoming more and more rebellious and has more or less decided that she is going to have her own way regardless. Now, what is the family um, uh, responsibility and what is the place of the girl in the decision? The place of the girl in the decision in this case is reasonably clear. Actually, she is not of age. Therefore, at this period in life, she is assumed naturally and psychologically uh, to be under the directive of the parents. Now, the power of the parents to exercise this directive depends very largely upon what has already been set down. If this is the first time the parents have ever crossed her, they are in for trouble and so is she. If this is the first time parental authority has stepped in and has now stepped in only because the parents are afraid for the child, we are going to have a little trouble up ahead because the foundations of value were not established soon enough. There was not enough understanding between parents and child. 
This is most likely true in this case, or other that otherwise the child would not be so completely resolute in determination to get out and get on their own. Had there been uh, a closer uh, understanding, this would not have been so intensive. Yet, obviously, a decision has to be made, and the decision finally worked out reasonably well due to a little careful thinking which met most of the factors involved. It was decided that the young lady was probably going to start college uh, in the next uh, year, therefore that she would go to a college in another community and thereby have a certain educational discipline, live in a girl's dormitory and be under supervision yet away from home. This seemed to meet the need. It was the struggle for individuality, and it was solved by the most simple process that we use, uh, the individual simply substituting one authority for another, but not escaping entirely from authority. If the child attempted to escape from authority completely at this age, the decision would have been wrong, both for her and for the parents. But the child might still force this decision and the parents be unable to prevent it. Then what comes of this? The answer is again that the parents may have and probably do have a certain karmic responsibility in this case. They have not uh, exercised proper prerogative. They have either bossed too much or too little. They have done something to reduce the confidence of the child. They have a right to apply all possible preventive means in the form of judgment. They can sit down and talk it over with the girl. They can do everything they can to inform her of the problems and the probabilities of her decision. If at the end of this time she resolutely refuses uh, to see any good in the, their side and is locked completely in the determination to be on her own, she will ultimately win her decision whether she has to wait a year or two or not, she will ultimately uh, force herself into this condition. She will be on her own. But this is only a fragment of a decision. The thing that she has not taken into consideration and cannot is the matter of the situations that will arise out of this decision and which will require a further series of decisions over a period of years. This she is not prepared for. So she has made a decision. She has said yes or no when she has not a full awareness of the facts. And all decisions made without awareness of the facts are likely to be uh, di dangerous. The parents may communicate some of the facts. If the person refuses to accept them, then the person involved creates a comic pattern also. They create a responsibility to gain through experience, perhaps suffering, that which they have refused to accept through counsel. Uh, nature is going to inevitably force these persons into proper decision, but it is often a long and difficult uh, path attended by sorrow and even tragedy. But where the person cannot think these things through reasonably, we have trouble. A decision is not merely a stubborn attitude. A decision is an enlightened attitude. It is in every case the individual using the best of his faculties to determine the course of his action, based upon the old Greek concept that that person is best and wisest, in whose nature that which is the best governs the rest. And this is where all decisions have to arise, trying to bring them from the best part of ourselves into common action. Then we must commit ourselves to a responsibility by a decision. It is very wise for us to analyze the problem carefully. For it may be that, an, that a commitment which is made today will not be according to our insight in the future. If we therefore bind ourselves with obligations which we cannot break without dishonoring our own nature, 
we are then very likely to ultimately be held in bondage by our own decisions, unless these are of a purely moral nature. If we therefore bind ourselves to organizations by commitment, if we bind ourselves to creeds or doctrines, or if we uh, mortgage the future to an unreasonable degree by some very heavy load that we assume, without full knowledge of the circumstances that may arise, it is quite possible that we shall get into a serious uh, or uh, unhappy state due to a decision that was made at a time when it seemed perfectly reasonable. But this reasonableness is no longer valid. I think we should all bear in mind then that all decisions that we make have to be conditioned decisions. It is becoming much too valuable, uh, too uh, dangerous to make decisions over futures, the facts of which we do not know. So instead of making decisions forever and ever today, I think we have to make decisions as of now, recognizing the importance of a living code of conduct rather than one that is bound to some past and ancient pattern. If, therefore, our decisions involve some special curbing of our attitudes, or the limitation of our perspective, or the abidance with or obedience to something which perhaps in the future we shall not admire as we do now, then I think our commitments must be conditional. The unconditioned commitment is a very serious thing for most people. Uh, in the old days, when families were rather close, for example, there were many unconditioned commitments, deathbed scenes primarily, in which some dying parent uh, bestowed upon one of the children responsibility for the whole family that this child must always sacrifice itself for the good of brothers and sisters. This kind of a commitment, secured by a deathbed scene for which there is very little possibility of defense, has led to some of the worst tyrannies in families that it is possible to imagine. Everyone exploited this one individual to death, uh, always holding over them a deathbed promise. This kind of decision simply should not be made. It is, it is wrong, basically. And while it, is, it would be uh, very difficult, perhaps, to face the scene when it arose, I, I think that in most cases it could be uh, rather astutely avoided as far as a final commitment is concerned. We can agree to do what we can. We will, uh, can agree to be helpful when necessary. But all this vast commitment to things, whether religious or political or cultural, economic, industrial, whatever it may be, such commitment is not reasonable. It cannot but ultimately form a bad pattern. So we should not commit ourselves by decision over matters which are subject to change, only that we will meet these changes as they come as honorably and honestly as we can, but we will not limit ourselves to the point that we cannot change our point of view. Therefore, a decision is something that is not irrevocable. It is irrevocable only to the situation as long as it remains as it is. But under a change of situation, under a new way of life, and life is changing so rapidly now that obsolescence sets in almost before decisions are made, uh, the, the decision shall be as of now. And if necessary, decisions can be made frequently. If as we go along it becomes necessary and obvious that a new decision bearing upon a certain matter shall be made, then we are responsible at each step of the, t of the procedure to make the best possible decision in the light of the present facts. If these facts change tomorrow, we must make a new decision. But it must always be in terms of 
conscientious acceptance of facts. If we will live each day in the light of the best that we know, and if every tomorrow we will add to our knowledge the new experiences that have come to us, and we will always, out of the total of our experience, try to plan the next step of our own way of life, and from the total of our experience and insight, uh, try to cooperate as fully as we can with the needs and problems of other people, we will make valuable decisions and we will keep them. And no individual who claims to be enlightened uh, can avoid the need for decision. Nor can anyone afford to admit weakness in the fact that having recognized a certain decision to be necessary, that he lacks the courage to continue the practice of that decision. Everywhere along, we simplify and make things easier. Also, the person who can make decisions is finally easier on his friends. When people know what we are going to do, know what to expect of us, know that we are honest, straightforward, that we are going to do things as clearly and cleanly and honestly as we can, we bestow upon them not only a good example, but a vast assistance in their relations with us. They know where we stand, they know what their own position can be and should be. It is very hard for our friends and families if we are undecided. If we do not know what we are doing or why, it is very difficult to hope that others can cooperate with us well. And it is wrong to subject other people to the shock of our constant vacillation from one attitude to another. So a great, a great and firm decision actually makes for a better relationship with society. Other people know the kind of people we are. They know they cannot impose upon us, and in this way we help to keep them honest. If we are weak in these matters, we are open invitation to be exploited by the weakness in other people. The individual who is without character is like a disease. He will spread his peculiar type of toxin to other people. Uh, every weak person is a vortex of dishonesty in space, even though he may commit no dishonest action himself. He becomes a center upon which others will turn their own exploiting instincts. Whereas if he is straight and clear in his own thinking, he helps to preserve the integrities of other people. If we can realize this, we will ultimately find that where a thing has to be done, that we will decide in the affirmative. If it is necessary and we can do it, we must do it. Therefore, to all necessary things, the answer is yes, they must be done. To all that is hurtful, to all that is generally against the common good, regardless of how much it may cater to our own satisfaction, to anything in which uh, we would resent having done to us that which our decision would cause us to do to another, any decision that weakens ourselves or others or compromises principles, the answer must be no. In those areas in which we are uninformed, where our own insight is not great enough, where the information necessary is not at hand, uh, where it is quite possible or probable that a little time will clarify, where it is also possible uh, that we will gradually come to a decision through circumstances where it is not sure or certain that a decision is immediately needed or where the decision involves some matter so trivial in its own nature uh, that it is of no abiding consequence. Then um, probably our answer could be perhaps. We will see. We will see how the thing develops and grows. We will not associate ourselves with a situation prematurely. We will wait until uh, we are aware 
of the full value of the pattern. In many museums of art, for example, the museum will not accept the work of a living painter. This is not because the living painter isn't good. It's because the art world wants to see how his art will develop through his lifetime. It may be that he will gain a great reputation and the museum will give him a strong endorsement and then for some reason he will change his style and destroy all the confidence that has been built in him. Everyone can make new mistakes until he is dead. Also, everyone can change and improve until they cease to exist. So the critic deciding the total career of the human being waits until that human being's career is finished. Now, in the same way, small problems that arise sometimes will go one way and sometimes another. It is premature for us to give our allegiance to causes that are not yet well-founded. It may be premature to give our decision as to, the, uh, as to the conclusion of event where the event itself is still in a formative state. Perhaps we cannot decide which politician we will vote for. We have to wait until he reveals his own character, his own platform more completely. So where it is wiser to wait, where wisdom calls for further consideration, or calls upon us to make a more detailed examination ourselves before passing judgment, therefore requiring additional time for research or thought, or for inquiry. Under those conditions, our answer is perhaps. But the perhaps answer should never be one which is an evasion. It should never arise from the fact that we do not want to commit ourselves. It should arise from the fact that we do not feel qualified to commit ourselves, that we are not sure, that we do not know, and therefore that any commitment would either be um, an, in, an over-intensive allegiance or else it would arise from some ulterior motive. Consequently, uh, the maybe decision is not an easy way out. When we say perhaps we are not tossing the responsibility back into the universe again, what we are really doing is giving ourselves the necessary breather. And in many decisions, particularly those that arise in a heated state of problem, we have to have a breather. Consequently, if at a time involving decision we are angry, upset, hurt, offended, feel a great injustice in ourselves and a natural antagonism against the cause thereof, that is not the time for a final decision. So in the absence of clarity of internal viewpoint, we must suspend judgment. We must do not less in our legal uh, handling of our own affairs than we would expect of a just court. We must therefore suspend judgment until we can think things through clearly and wisely and naturally and impartially. Where these decisions uh, are obscure, we have to give ourselves the breather. We have to give ourselves the time to decide. But from the moment that we say, perhaps, from that moment on, we are committed to investigate. We are not committed to ignore. We are not committed to drop the subject, using this merely as a means of getting out of a corner. We are now involved in a situation. And when we say, perhaps, we mean, I will give it further thought, not I will give it no further thought. We will investigate it. It has challenged us. The mere fact that we say perhaps is because we are not sure. And this uncertainty reveals an area of ignorance in our own natures. This is a challenge. We cannot permit this area to remain if it can be corrected. So the perhaps is only a reminder of more work to do in order that we may arrive at a correct decision. By thinking through these matters of correct decisions as carefully and wisely and lovingly as we can, we will greatly reduce the pressure of the burdens 
which we must carry and which we must also in the course of time transfer to other people. Well, our time is up, so thank you very much. Now, we have a new display this morning for you in the library. This is the story of playing cards. We have some very interesting ones, quite a few of them most artistic and unusual. We have quite a display of tarot cards, which will interest a number of people. And uh, we have some very beautiful oriental decorated cards. Uh, these cards are uh, quite uh, mysterious in their origin. The French writer, the Côte de Gabelin, believed that they were originally brought from Egypt by the gypsies and were based upon glyphs and patterns in the Egyptian temples. Regardless, the subject has been of great interest for a long time, and we have a nice exhibit of these cards from our permanent collection for you to observe this morning. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to talk on William James uh, on life after death. Of course, we're using his book as a kind of springboard. We want to get uh, a number of other points into it, but he has a very interesting ideal posi position in this matter. And as one of the America's pioneer psychologists and one of the most respected men in his field, and one of the few psychologists of the early period who was a trained Orientalist also. I think the Professor James' work is worthy of our uh, giving a little thought to, and his famous discussion on the problem of immortality given at Harvard is very interesting and was way ahead of its time. So we're going to take that uh, as a discussion next Sunday morning. Lecture note 61, The Lifeline of Words, is available on the table. Also, the 1965 ephemeris, for those who are interested in astrology and things of that nature. And words to the wise, which will help you, I think, in making some of the philosophical decisions of life, uh, is also a book which you may uh, want to know about. In the library, we'll have a number of interesting things for you to see, including some nice scrolls that you might like to look over, and material I brought back from my recent trip to the Orient. In the gift shop, we also have a number of new and, and rather exciting things for you to see. So we hope that as many of you as can will drift around a bit and see what is doing here. And uh, we have our meet again on Wednesday evening for the next lecture on our discussion of Buddhistic philosophy. This one will be the parallels between Buddhism and Western philosophy, which are quite interesting. And we thank you for being with us this morning and hope to see you next week.